scripture reading before our sermon this morning is coming from the book of 1 John, chapter 5. We'll be reading verse 14. 1 John, chapter 5, verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Certainly appreciate the opportunity to stand before you again today. I don't ever want to take that for granted. It's certainly my honor, it's my privilege to... Number one, to be a gospel preacher, but number two, uh, to work alongside you and labor with you for the cause of Christ here at Luxahoma. We are grateful for your attendance this morning. We have a number of visitors, and we are forever grateful that you've come our way. Uh, I want to reiterate what Blake said just a few moments ago, that you are so welcome to stay and be with us today as we have our monthly fellowship meal. Uh, there's always plenty, and there will always be plenty. We'll make sure of that. And if you'll come and uh, partake in that feast with us, along with the fellowship, that we'll have the opportunity to get to know you, and perhaps you will get the opportunity to know us a little bit better as well. Have you ever bowed your head in prayer? Poured out your heart to God, only to lift up your eyes to the sky and wondered if he heard a word that you said. I know that there probably have been times, it may have been times of despair, where you're looking for understanding about maybe why something happened. Why did I lose my loved one? Maybe things are just not going well in life. It could be from a financial standpoint. It could be from just anything that mankind has to deal with today to the point where we might even think, you know what, life's just not fair. So again, you bow your head in prayer and you pour out your heart to God and somehow you think that He has not heard anything I've said. I wonder if he did not hear my prayer. The Bible has a lot to say about prayer. But it also has a lot to say about the child of God in his relationship in prayer. Concerning the conditions that God has placed upon that individual as well as the prayer itself. And the fact is that we bow our heads before the very throne room of God with the intention of Him responding. Now we know that God responds to the prayers of His children. The Bible is very clear about that. The idea is, how does He answer my prayers? Well, sometimes He says yes, if it's in your best interest. You know, sometimes he says no if he thinks that this is not in your best interest. But there's also a third way that he answers prayers in the fact that he might say yes, but just not right now. In other words, the time is just not right. And because of that, we can sometimes raise our head up from our pillows after prayer and live with doubt. Sometimes it even goes to the realm of who is God and just really, really who is He to me. God has set conditions for our prayer lives. But I will tell you, that there are prayers that God will not answer. There are prayers that God will not answer. And the time that's been allotted to us this morning, I want us to look at 
three of those. And certainly this is not all conclusive, but the idea is that these three are probably the most that we struggle with. Number one, the prayer that God will not hear is the prayer that is not asked. It's the prayer that's not prayed. God cannot answer a prayer that has not been asked. And when you take into consideration that God knows everything we need before we even ask, that's Matthew chapter 6 and verse 8, we also have to understand that we must ask. In the text that was read to you a moment ago, and of course, when we look at this, uh, we understand that, that as the apostle is writing this, the apostle John, he's writing this with the purpose of fellowship in mind, fellowship with those other Christians, but also fellowship with God. And so he responds about prayer in this way. And he says about our confidence coming before God, that this is our confidence in Him. Now notice the next word, if. If we ask. The idea is that God says that this is a condition. Just because He knows what you need or the difficulties in which you are suffering, or even the times in which you are rejoicing that would give God thanksgiving, he says that you have to ask. You have to make this request. You have to trust me enough that this is a two-way relationship. This is about fellowship. This is about us having something in common. I created you for this purpose. I've spoken to you through my holy and divine word. Talk to me. Tell me what it is. At the very least, what you think you need. What you think you want to offer. The Bible tells us in James chapter 4 and verse number 2... Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because you ask not. And so God puts the responsibility back upon His creation. He puts it back upon His child. For us to spend ample time in communicating with Him so He'll know what our desires are, what our wishes are, and really what this struggle or what even, again, this time of thanksgiving really means to me. The Bible is very clear that God has promised to hear if we ask. In Matthew chapter 7, beginning at verse number 7, Jesus is preaching this, the greatest sermon ever, ever preached. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. And he starts there by saying in verse 7, Ask and you shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth. He that seeketh findeth. And he that knocks, it is opened unto you. Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8. And so he, he, he aligns us in this time of fellowship with him just to ask. Ask, and it shall be given you. Why is it sometimes we have this relationship with God, and yet we never, we never ask him? We never ask him for the things that we need. How boisterous, how egotistical, 
Uh, maybe even the characteristics of a, of a narcissist to rely upon this relationship and say, he knows what I need. You wouldn't do that in the human realm, would you? You wouldn't look to your spouse and, and look at your husband or wife and, and need something from that individual, whether it be intimacy or affection or, or just the, the, the companionship of which we need. And, and well, she, he ought to know better. She ought to know better. No, we would ask. We, we, would, we would take that step and we would make sure that our request is made known unto the person who can fulfill that. Why not with God? Why not with God? Because in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12, the Bible says this, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and you can finish this, and His ears are are open to their prayers. What a guarantee. What a guarantee that, that every time as a faithful child of God that I bow my head in prayer that God's ears are open, that He hears me. I don't have to... Do you hear me? It's with great confidence that I bow before his throne, knowing, first of all, he already knows my situation, but to pour out my soul over that situation to the one who has all the answers. It would be foolish to allow that opportunity to go by. Number two. Not only does that God cannot hear prayers that are not asked, but God will not. Let me emphasize this. Will not answer prayers that are littered with doubt. God will not hear those prayers that are littered with doubt. Go back to our text in verse number 14. At the very beginning of this passage, again, John writing for encouragement here, when he goes back and he tells them, he says, and this, what? Our communication. And this is the confidence we have in him. The idea of confidence, the idea of being assured of coming before God, that number one, he is the God, he's the one true and living God, but also the fact is that with great confidence in this relationship, to come before him doubting what he can do, but what about this, doubting what he will do in whatever situation I might find myself in. If Open your Bibles with me, if you will, to... James chapter 1. Now, in James chapter 1, beginning at verse number 5. Now, I know Ryan covered this last week. Marvelous, marvelous job on the whole first chapter of the book of James. But the idea of going before God in prayer with doubt in our minds is something that is contrary to the will of God if one is going to be faithful to his creator. Notice this in beginning in verse number 5. He says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who give it, that give it to all men liberally and unbraideth not, and it shall be given him, but let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And so, uh, so here's the mindset. If you're going to ask, number one, be assured of what you're asking. Number two, be assured of who you're asking. And number three, be assured 
that God has an answer. The idea of, of a wave that's, that's tossed on any given day, in other words, ever how the wind's blowing, to be described in that way in my relationship with God, you and I might say flippant in our common everyday language. But the idea is to be tossed back and forth as to in this relationship with God where I'm speaking to Him on a regular basis and then being in this relationship with God where I doubt that He will ever answer. When you think about everything that God has promised and when you think about everything that God has said, that should instill in us a type of faith that when we approach the throne of God, that that's the type of faith that we might call rock solid. As a matter of fact, our faith actually determines our prayers. Our faith actually uh, determines our prayers. Uh, because when you stop and think about what the Hebrews writer said in, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, in verse number 1, he said, Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The substance there being confidence. The evidence there being conviction. Our faith is based upon confidence in God and His promises and the conviction that He's going to carry out those promises. And if God has promised that He is actually going to hear our prayers, hear the prayers of the faithful because His ears are over the righteous, then why doubt? Why is there doubt? I think doubt finds itself in our minds, in our relationship with God, when we allow too much of the world to occupy our minds. Because if our focus is and should be upon God solely as number one, then it's with a constant, a constant prayer life that I come before Him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. You know it well. Paul said, pray without, you finish it. Ceasing. Every opportunity, every reason, every circumstance, every situation. You know what a good situation is today? The sun came up and we are thankful to God. So we pray. We come before Him. Without doubt, God made the sun. He made it to come up. You know what? It's going to go down. He made it to do that too. He made you, didn't he? Made me. If you don't believe me, just ask some of these cradle roll children. Who made you? They'll tell you. If you're, if you're doubting. So here's the thing. To go before him in doubt, again, contrary to the word of God. How about coming to him with all confidence? Perhaps coming to him boldly, as the Bible tells us. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, where the Hebrews writer there is explaining that we have a better high priest in Christ Jesus. And because of that, you remember the high priest went into the Holy of Holies to, to offer the sacrifice on behalf of the people under that old covenant. But now, but now, we have a, a high priest who's, who's entered in through the veil once and for all. He's a better high priest. And because of that, the Hebrews writer says in chapter 4 and verse 16, let us therefore come boldly, Unto the throne of God of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our present need. So here's the thing. Think about the idea of coming boldly. You ever seen a TV program perhaps where the, where the um, 
uh, the, the police are invading a house and they might have some kind of object where they're knocking through the door or, or you know, you have some of these manly men, you know, who, who take their foot and they kick that door open. I, I don't, I, I guess somebody could actually do that, but, but, but they kick that door open, but they bust through that door and you know that they are there. You can't hide that. God says, bust through the door of my throne room. Let me know you're here. Tell me what's on your mind. Don't doubt me. For I'm the God of your fathers, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am your God and you are my son or my daughter. Because I am God. God will not, God will not hear those prayers that are offered with doubt. Lastly, number three, God does not hear those who reject His will. God does not hear those who who reject his will. Go back to verse 14 of our text in, in 1 John chapter 5. There John again writes, and this is the confidence that we have in him if we ask anything, now listen to him, according to his will, he heareth us. And so the, the idea is that we ask according to his will. I think sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we, we go before the throne room of God and we think that just because we ask, we deserve. But the thing about it is, you and I don't know the future, but God certainly does. And God knows all of the situations that today will entail in the future if the world stands. So He's got everything in full view. The only view that you and I have with clear vision is hindsight. Don't we say that? Hindsight is 2020. Well, God's foresight is 2020. You and I don't have that. So we depend upon Him. And so we depend upon Him that when we ask something of Him, that it's according to His righteous will. The Old Testament is littered with this thought. The idea that if we ask, we have to ask according to what God has already said and what God says about the future. In Proverbs chapter 28, verse 9, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. Now this is Solomon writing. This is Solomon writing considering everything that had happened in his life. And he goes back and he says that the idea of making a decision, approaching God without his law in mind, without his will to be considered, is an abomination. But also listen to the psalmist in Psalm 66 and verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not Hear me. If I regard iniquity in my heart, we know what that means because we've seen the opposite of that in someone like the life of David when he was a man after God's own heart. As he even wrote in the idea that, that thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And so to take into that consideration, God's will has to be considered every time we bow our heads in prayer. But the New Testament, our authority in religion today, we know that this is fact. This truth is true. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he Heareth. John chapter 9 and verse 31. 
one who is going to be a worshiper of God. Uh, when I teach a, 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 a leadership class with, with men who come before a congregation perhaps to lead an opening prayer or a closing prayer, or, or perhaps they gather around the Lord's table to offer prayer concerning our partaking of the, the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine, or, or the individual who might lead a prayer for the offering the free will offering that the congregation is given. And, and, and I try to stress boldly that if your heart is not right with God, don't lead that prayer. Don't stand before those people because you want this prayer to get above this ceiling and beyond the ears of those in attendance where it lands at the feet of God on His righteous throne. You have done no one any service whatsoever if you stand before God's people and pray when God says that there's iniquity in your heart. Where has that prayer gone? Just to the mind of the individual and the ears of those who are listening. And never any further. It's certainly that way in our private lives. So why would it not be that way in our public lives? And, and so we follow what Paul said to examine ourselves whether we be in the faith. In other words, we have this righteous relationship with God. This, this fellowship in which he's extended to us and we've accepted according to his will. And because of that, you and I will approach him. With his will in mind. Again, you go back to the Sermon on the Mount. We don't pray like the hypocrites. We don't stand like the Pharisee and raise our head up to the heavens and thank God that we're not like someone else while the publican is on his knees with his face to the ground who utters the words, Father, forgive me, for I'm a sinner. The idea is what's in our hearts when we come before God in prayer. A again, the sermon's not conclusive in the sense that there are other prayers that God doesn't hear, but in this sense, it's the... It, this puts us in the arena to think about our prayers, doesn't it? So are there prayers that God will not hear? Sure. Uh, there's the prayers God cannot hear that you don't ask. Uh, there's the prayer that God will not hear if it's offered with doubt. And then there's the prayer that God does not hear if it's not according to His will. Uh, this is where I guess I would ask, how's your prayer life? Maybe I should ask this. How's your relationship with God? Your relationship with God begins by obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ according to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. We obey the gospel when we come to God in faith and obedience. That faith and obedience says that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. For Jesus said, if you believe not that I am He, you shall die in your sins. John 8, 24. And that faith says that I repent of my past sins. I changed my mind about my former way of life. And my life now is directed toward God. Jesus said, I tell you nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Luke 13, verse 3. He says it again in verse 5 then I must be willing to confess Jesus as the Son of God. But I do that publicly. Uh, Jesus said, if you will confess me before men, you will I confess before my Father, which is in heaven. Matthew 10, verse 32. But look at verse 33. But if you deny me before men, ye will I deny before my Father, which is in heaven. But then I must be immersed in water 
Some say that's not important. Some say that's not necessary. But the Bible has a different <coughs> position on that. And that position is basically this. It says that baptism washes away our sins. Acts 22 and verse 16. 1 Peter 3.21 says that baptism saves us. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 that the purpose for baptism is for the remission or forgiveness of sins. So I can't have this relationship with God without baptism. But you know what? I can't have this relationship with God and my prayers be heard if I'm not a faithful child of God. The Bible tells us to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. But John said it this way, the same writer of the text we've been studying, when he said, be faithful unto death, and I will give unto thee a crown of life. Revelation 2 and verse 10. Where are you in your relationship with God? Is he... Ears open to your prayers. Only you can answer that today. And we're going to encourage you with the song. And if you need to respond right now, we hope that you'll come as together we stand. And